Hello. I'm Ian McKenzie, the director of the aviation program, and I'd like to welcome you here to the University of Waterloo today. Uh, we're going to give you some information on our aviation programs that we have here at the university. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Suzanne Kearns. I'm a professor of aviation here at the University of Waterloo, and I'll be uh, supporting Dr. McKenzie and giving you sort of a brief overview of how aviation works at the university. And we do hope that we, there will be time for questions and answers at the end. So please do send those questions in and we'll be happy to answer them. So at the University of Waterloo, we have three uh, programs, uh, geography and aviation, science and aviation, and the aviation specialization. So I think the best way to think about this is that uh, there are two flight programs. And so if you wanted to be a pilot, you're looking at geography and aviation or on the next slide, science and aviation. So for the first part, uh, geography and aviation, what we'll be looking at is a variety of geography courses that explore aspects of weather patterns, uh, geographic information systems or GIS and remote sensing. But in addition to that, you have the aviation component, which are on-campus courses in aviation that look at things like safety and human factors, aviation sustainability, as well as going to the local airport to do your flight training. In the science and aviation program, you will be focusing on the core sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, and earth sciences, and the opportunity to get a Bachelor of Science degree, plus your aviation. So we do have a new option that has just started for the first time this year, which we're really excited about, and it is called the Aviation Specialization. So this is a little bit different because the Aviation Specialization does not include flight training as a required component of the course. So this would be something that you might pursue if maybe you already have your pilot licenses already, uh, because anything more than a private pilot license, it's not really a good fit for our either geography and aviation or science and aviation degree program. Programs. But if you're still wanting that degree and you want to take some academic courses in aviation, what we would strongly encourage you to think about is applying to the Geography and Environmental Management program, and you would be targeting the aviation specialization. Now, this would be, um, you would get either a three or a four year degree in geography, plus take the academic aviation courses at the university, the same courses that the pilots would be taking as well. Uh, you're also able to transfer into the specialization up to a private pilot license for some credit. So either it's a it's a good path either if you have some pilot uh, um, training already and some licenses already uh, or if you're targeting a ground-based aviation career perhaps like airport management or airline management. So the, the way that the programs break down, I think if you can look at this, you can see that the aviation component on the both of these is, is about 33%. So what this means is that the aviation component is both uh, your flight training. So that would be uh, credits that you are given for going to the airport and completing your pilot licenses. Uh, you get the equivalent of about a year's worth of university credit for the flight training activities that you'll be undertaking as part of the program. And the flight training part is exactly the same, the between geography and aviation and science and aviation. But if you look at sort of the other aspects of that, of that graph, you'll see that uh, the other courses will vary depending on whether you are in the geography or the science stream. So you can see in geography, of course, there'll be more of a focus on geography and geomatics, uh, environment, computer science, and some electives. In the science and aviation program, the focus will be largely on the core sciences that I already mentioned, earth science, physics, biology and chemistry. Um, there will be fewer electives in the science and aviation program. Uh, the same number of units or courses required for both programs, 20 units or 40 courses. Um, and as Dr. Kearns had mentioned, that the uh, aviation component is essentially one quarter of your University of Waterloo degree. Uh, the largest number of transfer credits to any aviation program in Canada, uh, one quarter of the flight training counts towards the University of Waterloo degree. That's because the University of Waterloo has a strong experiential learning component uh, at, at Waterloo. And so that's why we focused on that. And then three quarters of your degree are academic courses taken at the University of Waterloo. And these academic courses give you that opportunity to 
pay tuition for only three years out of the four years because the flight trainings costs are set separate. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a real key advantage of the University of Waterloo that people don't always recognize. It's that if you love aviation and you want to be a pilot, you will sometimes encounter people in the industry who will say, just do any degree and then fly on your own. And uh, and that they think that that's sometimes a really good option. But the reason why this program is better is because you get that year's worth of university credits towards your degree for the flight training. So in essence, as Dr. McKenzie mentioned, you're saving a year's worth of university tuition because you don't pay the university for those credits uh, associated with your flight training. And we also built this degree based on the aviation components um, and the, the degree components so that you're coming out with uh, relationships in those various courses that you may even take in, in science or in geography related to practical industry. Yes, and I think uh, as Dr. McKenzie sort of hinted at, um, one of the real strengths that we have grown in our program is we have become the largest university level pilot training program in Canada. So this year, in uh, first year at the University of Waterloo, my first year introduction to aviation class has about 175 students in it, but about 120 of those are students who are intending to be pilots and, and the others are perhaps in the aviation specialization or taking that class as an elective. Now, this isn't something you always realize at the beginning of your program, but having a large program is incredibly important because networking is usually how a lot of people in aviation get that first job. So. Being part of a large program gives you, um, you know, more opportunity to have and grow your network and then collectively to work with, uh, there's a new University of Waterloo Aviation Society. So it's a student society supporting the interest of aviation students. Uh, we hosted a virtual career day last week and uh, actually that was yesterday <laughs> and the week prior, uh, as well as a variety of social events. So you really do become part of a community uh, and that's something that we think is really important to your future success. From the flight training perspective, you will graduate if you are in the flight uh, part of the program with your commercial multi-engine and instrument ratings. The Waterloo Wellington Flight Center at the Waterloo Region International Airport is where you'll take your flight training. It's located about 25 minutes from the University of Waterloo. Uh, should mention that at this point, there's no direct bus to the airport, so transportation could be an, an issue. But uh, since you are coming in a, a year or two to our program and flight training, um, with a new ION service that we have, uh, uh, light rail transit that we have. Uh, we're integrating the, uh, our networks for transportation at Waterloo. And just to let you know that the aircraft, they have, there's about 30 different air, uh, 30 aircraft at the Waterloo Wellington Flight Cent Center, running from Piper Seminoles to Cessnas, 152s, 172s, and Diamond DA-40, and simulators. In fact, there are two all sim simulators now at uh, Waterloo Wellington uh, Flight Center. One just arrived and is, was installed a couple of uh, weeks ago and they're waiting for uh, Transport Canada certification as, that a, as an official flight simulator. Absolutely. And, and I think uh, Dr. McKenzie sort of explained this really well, that it's an advantage in a pilot training program to be exposed to a variety of different types of aircraft, because when you evolve and move forward in your career and you're a professional pilot, maybe in an airline or, or in another setting, you often will have to learn to fly a new type of aircraft and, and transition through various types. So there's an advantage in having a sort of diverse fleet to giving you exposure to different kinds of flying environments. Um, but as we move forward, I think it's also really important to understand that there are some su substantial costs in our program associated with flying. So the way that this works is that the Waterloo tuition that you will pay is approximately $26,000 spread out over the four years of your program. Um, it says below that it's about $8,700 for three years. And again, even though you're here for four years, you're only paying three years worth of tuition to the university because the university is granting you a year's worth of academic credits for your flight training. So that saves you, again, approximately you know, $9,000 worth of tuition, which is a really good thing and something we're really proud of. We think that this reinforces something at the University of Waterloo where we value how important that education is. 
The flight training costs are paid directly to the Waterloo Wellington Flight Center, and it's paid on an hourly type basis. So um, they want to have a few thousand dollars on account. And then when you go flying, it will just uh, sort of be a metric where they see how long you've flown for, and they will deduct or, or sort of pay that off of your account, withdraw those uh, expenses off of your account. And then when your account gets close to empty, they'll ask you to put more funds on account. So it's not like at the university where there are sort of set dates for tuition, the flight training costs are very much about when you are flying and how quickly you're sort of making progress and the, the cost is associated with that. Um, so it says an average of 23,800, but that's not really how flight training works because it's not sort of exactly the same each year. Uh, the reason being is that uh, in a normal year when we're not dealing with a global pandemic, uh, flight training starts in January of your first year. And so that first year is a little bit, uh, you, you wouldn't have any flight training costs for the first semester at all. Uh, but then likewise, as you progress in your training, when you start flying a multi-engine aircraft, they're significantly more expensive per hour than the aircraft you would fly at the beginning of training. So there's a higher cost associated with that. So um, where the university tuition is very set, you know, it's a specific amount. Uh, and you, very predictable. The flight training costs vary based on the type of aircraft that you are flying, uh, what stage of training that you are in. And if there's a period where there's you know really bad weather and you don't fly for three weeks, well, you, there's not going to be a cost for those three weeks as well. But in a very sort of overall sense, you can think of, of around $100,000 for the Waterloo tuition and fees and the flight training costs. Um, there is a little bit more of an additional expense if you choose to uh, undertake what's called the Integrated Airline Transport Pilot Pathway. Um, this would be a pathway where it is more targeted towards an airline pilot career. And we don't have time to get into a lot of the details of that, but that is an option for students who do not already have a private pilot license. If you already have a private pilot license, you can come and join our program and get credit for that private pilot license. And in essence, you save, I think, seventeen dollars or $18,000 in flight training, and you would start with a bit of advanced standing in our program. Please do keep in mind that line at the bottom that these numbers do not include food, housing, and living expenses. Of course, you need to eat and live while you're here, and, and so, of course, need to budget for those things as well. Um, so before you start your program, uh, the Waterloo Wellington Flight Center, because the flight training really is under the umbrella of them, and they're an amazing flight school. They've been in, around for a very long time, uh, one of the, the best uh, flight schools in Canada, in, in our opinion. Um, so when it comes to specific flight training questions, it's really important that you attend a WWFC information session. If you go to their website, you should be able to find when those are scheduled for and sign up for one. Uh, before you join our program, you also need your Transport Canada Category 1 medical exam. The reason being is because even though you need a lower category exam, a Category 3, to be a private pilot license, anybody who wants to be a professional pilot requires a Category 1 medical. Uh, we want everybody joining our program to get that before they start. Because if there is something about you medically that's going to prevent you from becoming a professional pilot, whether it's like a heart issue or vision issue, whatever it happens to be, maybe you're not even aware of, that we want you to know that before you uh, orient your life towards this future career. So this is for your benefit, really, just to make sure that this is a career that's viable for you in your future. And an aviation language proficiency test uh, only for permanent residents and visa students. Um, this is because in aviation, English is the international language of aviation. You need to speak it over the radio. So it has a broad safety implication. And so we, there is a requirement for English language as well. Ian, did you want to speak to this one? Um. So uh, just to give you some background at the University of Waterloo, our program started in 2007. We graduated our first class in 2011, and we have uh, trained pilots that are working across the globe and even flying to all the continents, even Antarctica. Um, we have some of our graduates, uh, based on their programs, have that expertise to, to, to do those types of things with their degree, but also uh, flying in remote locations globally, but also with major airlines in Canada and global. So we have a very strong reputation for our instructors and uh, our world-class professors at the University of Waterloo. And we have a very high reputation for innovation and employability in our program. And uh, we're constantly changing. 
Yes. So I think that's uh, sort of a broad overview. Uh, we did want to make sure we had time for questions and answers at the end. So if you do have any questions, if anything comes to mind, if you do want to type them into the Q&A function. And uh, Shabby, who's one of our, our amazing uh, aviation students, she is collecting those questions. I know she's answered some of them now. But um, Shabby, if there are other questions that you would like us to speak to, would you mind sharing those with us, please? Um, and uh, there is a question around the, the airline transport pilot license. Would you like to speak to that or, or would you like me to? Um, oh, I just actually I just saw a few questions come in. So, uh, Ian, when do we when do they need their medical certificate? They should try and have their medical certificate by August, uh, end of August, the year that they're starting the program. So if you're coming in in 2021 class, you should have that medical by August. You wouldn't start flying until later. And actually, this is a good time to introduce that. We've had a backlog of in flight training uh, because we were uh, the flight training for our classes have been delayed for about five months. So some of our students will not be start flying until 2022, uh, even though they started this past year. So that's going to be slipping through for the next couple of years. So in the university calendar, it says flight training starts in January of 2022. But for the incoming class of 2021, that will be January of 2023. And the class coming in in 2022, we're going to slip another year as well because we want to clear, make sure that we're able to clear all of the students that are currently in our aviation program currently. Yes. Uh, the next question is about the cost of the program. And so I've moved it back to the tuition and fees slide. So I think the answers are on that slide. But while I think you look at the tuition, there's a third question about whether we get an airline transport pilot license. So um, for those of you who don't have a lot of background in aviation, it can be really confusing because there's a lot of different licenses. So you start with your private pilot license, you move to your commercial pilot license, which gives you the privilege to work as a pilot. But with only a commercial pilot license, very few job opportunities are available for you. Um, so you, you would add a multi-engine rating, which allows you to fly an aircraft with more than one engine. So usually two <laughs> engines on each wing, one on each wing, and an instrument rating, which allows you to fly without visual reference to the ground. So you can fly through clouds and pretty much every airline flight will always fly under instrument rules. Um, so then the airline transport pilot license can be considered the senior professional pilot license. But the issue is to get that license, you need 1500 hours, flight hours. Um, that is far more than you want to pay for as part of your experience. So what is a, a sort of a new license pathway is called an integrated airline transport pilot license which allows you to come to our program to complete all of uh, the same flight training as everyone else with the addition of one extra course. And then you write a series of exams towards your airline transport pilot license. And sometimes this is called a, a frozen ATPL or a frozen airline transport pilot license because you write those exams and you kind of like put them in the bank and save them for later. And you go out and fly and you build your additional flight experience. And then when you get your 1500 hours, those exams apply to your new experience and you get your airline transport pilot license. That gives you the privilege to fly as captain on an aircraft that requires two pilots. So that is something that is possible to do within our program, but it's an option. It's not a requirement. And it is only applicable for those who do not already have previous flight experience. So if you come to our program with a PPL, um, it doesn't allow you to follow that pathway. However, uh, I think Brendan has that question about if you already have your PPL, when you come into the program, you get transfer credits for Avia 101 and 102. And uh, I think that's important. Um, you could still I, join the integrated program, but only 30 hours would be credited for your PPL in that situation. So you wouldn't be able to use the full 65 or 70 in the program, but they would be part of your total time. Yeah, so there's another question. So what's a typical day for an aviation student like? Um, this is hard to answer now because 
there is no normal day now during the pandemic. I think, as you can see, we're all in our basements working from home, just like all of you. Uh, so aviation students now, um, the ones who are in first year, I'm teaching them all online. So we uh, we don't see each other uh, in a classroom like we would normally. But in normal in a normal situation, and assuming hopefully society's back to normal next year, uh, then you would have in September of your first year, you would usually have five classes on campus, and those would be spread out. You would have those every week, and you would be sort of a typical university student for that first semester. And then also in a more normal year, uh, starting in January of your first year, you would probably take less classes. So you maybe would take four university classes and you would also actively uh, start your flight training experience. Ian, can you speak to what uh, flight training is like each week for a student? So flight training each week, uh, students are expected to uh, book three, out, uh, three flights per week. Um, Weather dependent, uh, one of the situations in Canada, particularly when you start, if you start your flight training in January 2022, um, that the uh, the time that you would have in your in the in the airplane in January and February is obviously going to be much less. Um, but along with the flight goes classes uh, each week uh, in preparation for the ground school and flight labs. Um, the amount of work that is required for that, those classes are usually uh, five hours a week, um, normal plus two hours of labs. So you, most university courses are only three hours lecture and a couple of labs. So you're carrying quite a heavy load. Uh, we like to look at it as essentially you're doing a double major. You're getting a, a science degree, Bachelor of Environmental Studies degree in geography, or at, plus your aviation credential. So time management is key to be successful at the University of Waterloo. So there's a question here about what should I put in the AIF to increase my chances of acceptance? I, I think this is really important to acknowledge because in, I know in a lot of the promotional materials for our program, it says that students need a low 80s average to be considered admissible to our program or to be competitive. Um, this year and likely the next year, so 2021 and 2022, are likely to be a little bit different because we are still recovering from the pandemic and the slowdowns that has caused in the flight training uh, capacity with our partner. So, um, Ian, can you speak to the numbers we're expecting and what students should do to optimize their chances of admission? Well, we look at averages, that will be one, but the academic information, some of the things that you have uh, achieved already, uh, volunteering, um, sports activities, other activities that you have in your life that uh, you're not just sitting in front of a computer your whole life. Uh, we want a well-rounded student with lots of activities in there as well. We want you to keep that in the university environment as well to stay active. That's very important. So we're looking at that. Um, with respect to numbers of intakes for the next couple of years, as I say, we're trying to clear, we have one of the largest, the largest university program in Canada. And so we have quite a number of students already in the system. So we're reducing our in intake to about 60 students this year from 125 uh, last year. And for the next two years to try and move the system through uh, the students that are already in the program, we want to make sure that they get out uh, at a, uh, a very good opportunity to, com to start their careers. Other questions? Um, let me see. So uh, Ian, there's a question here about over the summer, how many hours per day are spent at the flight center? Um, because they're wondering about part-time employment over the summer. Right, uh, part-time uh, employment is, is certainly an option. Um, you need to have some employment to pay for this expensive degree. It is the most expensive University of Waterloo degree because of the flight training costs that are added to it. Uh, but certainly, yes, it is possible to do that. Um, the employment should be flexible so that uh, on a day that you have good weather and it's a good flying day, um, hopefully you've booked that flight on that day and you can... and tell your employer, but perhaps maybe I should uh, uh, be flying today. So part-time jobs are certainly uh, one of the ways to do that. And uh, the airport actually uh, employs a number of senior students uh, for dispatch and things like that uh, in their upper years. So something to look forward to. 
Um, so there's another question from Sona about how do you get the category one medical certificate? Um, so this is administered through Transport Canada and they do have a, uh, a link online uh, where you can find Transport Canada um, medical examiners all around the world. Um, so Ian, I'm gonna give you a question and then I'll look up that link and put it in, into the chat. Okay. Um, Ian, can you speak to employment opportunities for students after they graduate? Right. So uh, employment opportunities, they vary. Uh, the traditional employment opportunities, uh, when our programs uh, first graduated, our first students uh, in 2011, uh, they took the traditional route. They started at something which is called working the ramp, working at an airport someplace uh, for a small company, uh, flying small airplanes, moving them around, fueling them and so on, um, and working the way up through what they want to try and do. In aviation, your whole life is an, an, an interview. Uh, everybody's looking at you to see, are you the right fit for this company? And that goes right up to major airlines. So reputation is important, um, how you conduct yourself and moving forward with that. So you could be, working uh, in air medivac, you could be working in the north, uh, ferrying work crews around from place to place. Uh, that's the traditional route. Uh, four years ago, we started a program, a cadet program here at the University of Waterloo with Sunwing and Jazz and Porter. So we have some connections with those airlines, but most of you know currently that things are slowed down in the industry. So, um, we will have to, we're on pause with that, uh, direct entry into airlines, but we, we're looking forward to the future that that'll start again. So there is a question around how competitive the program is. Uh, this is a, also a moving target. And so I, I did type an answer into the chat, but just to, to reiterate that in, in a normal year, if you had a, a low 80s average, if you're an Ontario high school student, you're coming in with a low 80s average, uh, then you have a pretty good chance uh, of getting an offer to the program. But because of COVID, we're likely going to have to limit the intake for to this next September and the September after to about half of the students that we took in this year. And so because of that, it's going to be uh, pushing the average higher for people who are going to be more likely to get an offer. So what I would really strongly recommend uh, students do, if you're particularly Ontario high school students, is that you want to shoot for the highest academic average possible in your top, I think it's the top six grade 12 courses. Um, that is what's going to be most likely uh, to grant you an offer to come to the university. It's very much a supply and demand process that the university does centrally. You can imagine they get hundreds of thousands of applications applications. So they look at how many applications they get, how many spots they get, and uh, and then based on that interest, the students with the highest average will get their offer first. Uh, so maybe January or February, and then they sort of work down until the program is full. And so because there's fewer spots this year, again, I, I would really want to reiterate that um, the best thing you can do is to really try to optimize uh, your, your grades in high school if you're interested in admission. But uh, Ian, can you speak to international students? I know it's an entirely different process. Right. Uh, for international students, um, we you have to have a, a, a valid visa to study here in, in Canada um, and jobs for international students. After you graduate, um, if you are eligible for a work permit when you graduate as a pilot, uh, the opportunities there for you to um, get one of these airline jobs eventually. So that's it, it takes a while to get up to that uh, spot, but we do have uh, offshore. Uh, we have uh, students who've graduated from our pro program working for um, Cathay Pacific, for example, or Singapore Airlines. And uh, some of them were international students and some of them are Canadians who have ended up in those locations. So I want to take this opportunity on behalf of uh, Dr. McKenzie and myself to thank you for your interest in aviation here at Waterloo, and we sincerely hope to see you on campus in the future when we're all back on campus again. <laughs> so thank you for your time.